It's all about you. Now, it's quite uncommon for a book to begin with such a provocative declaration. But the book we will discuss today is an uncommon book because it makes the case that understanding what it really means to say it's, it's all about you could be the key for a fulfilling life, could be the key for achieving a state of happiness, and it could be the key for building strong relationships of love and relationships of passion. So the book we'll discuss today is called Effective Egoism, an individualist guide to pride, purpose, and the pursuit of happiness. And is written by our very own Don Watkins. This is New Idea Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. So Don, I had the pleasure of reading this book. Now, people, you'll have a version which this is a, this is a, a, a copy, uh, which you're going to have a better, the yellow version. But I've read this book and I have so many good things to say, but I want to start with a question. I was reading this book and at the moment I thought, that's a philosophy book. But then I thought, no, no, actually, this is a self-development book. And then I thought, no, no, this is a book about what it really means to pursue happiness. So what type of book did you write and why did you write it? And the goal was to write a book that was aimed at helping a person achieve happiness. And I think to do that, you need philosophy, but there's also a lot that you need about implementing a philosophy. Philosophy gives you a broad framework for living your life. The fundamental principles that are going to help you reach knowledge and guide your action towards values. But philosophy, even though it encompasses all of our knowledge, it's not exhaustive of all the knowledge that we need to achieve our goals, including our goal of happiness. And so a lot of what I was trying to do in the book is say, like, here's the philosophic framework you need in order to live your best life. But then here's a lot of other knowledge that I've gathered over the years about how do I put this into practice? And so we'll delve more into this, but just to give one example, philosophy tells you you should build your life around a productive career. And that's really important, really illuminating. But how do you choose a career that's going to be fulfilling to you? And how do you actually succeed in it and build that kind of career? That philosophy can't tell you, or at least it can't tell you everything that you would like to know about it. So I, it's philosophy plus is one way to think about it. Okay, so this is not a book of someone who, because usually we, it's psychologists who write such book, right? Or people who say, look, I've done experiments and evolutionary psychology or evolutionary biology shows uh, this and this and this. So this book is written then by which point of view? Because I know you as a student of ideas, as someone who we could describe you more as a philosopher rather than, let's say, a psychologist. So what is your angle in writing the book? What is what is the way through the prism through which you view the issue of happiness? I mean, I don't think about it in those terms exactly. Like I thought about this as a book written by me. That is, I'm somebody who's thought a lot about things. I've been heavily informed by philosophy and influenced by Ayn Rand above all, but I've learned from a lot of other people too. So I, this book is by far the most personal one that I've written. And it's really like if you were to spend a week with me just hanging out on vacation and we'd be talking about life, like these are the key ideas that I would probably be talking about. And that's, I wanted the book to really feel like it was written by a person and, and that it has a lot of me in it. And so that's how I was thinking about it. And going through life, yeah, when I'm thinking about philosophy, I'm trying to make a de delineation between is this philosophy? Is this psychology? Is this on the borderline between the two? Is this a scientific issue? But in the book, that's not really at the foreground because my goal is not to present a philosophy, but just to present ideas for how to achieve a life that's rich in meaning and joy. So you said that reading this book in some ways is like someone is having a conversation with you and... A conversation with you is always an interesting experience. And the book, from the very beginning, goes straight to the point. So the way it's organized, it's organized in some lessons. And we will go through them lesson by lesson. And some of them we're going to spend more time because there's, uh, it, it looks like you put more of, uh, you're more invested in, in these lessons. But let's start with lesson number one. And lesson number one is your 
life matters. And let me read my favorite quote from that, uh, from that lesson. Quote, you hear Cyrano de Bergerac declare that he has decided to be admirable in everything for everything. You witness a fugitive declare in open court, I am Jean Valjean. You listen as scout is exhorted, stand up, your father is passing. You gaze at Michelangelo's David or David's death of Socrates. You are swept away by the first movement of Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto or the last movement of Marachmanin of seconds. These experiences and the deep soul changing emotions they evoke elevate you. Elevate means inspire you to live for a moral ideal. And this, as you tell us in the next page, is the path to happiness, to live for an ideal, but an earthly ideal that treats your life as sacred. So from the very beginning, we see that our life here is not like a routine where, eh, you know, some things happen. What I got from this chapter is the strongest emotions that you can get from art or from great moments, this gravitas should also be present in your own life. So tell us a bit more about this lesson, Don, that your life matters. We already gave the starting quote, which is it's all about you. And that's deliberately pushing back or um, riffing on a, a quote by a mega blockbuster uh, called Purpose Driven Life, which starts out, it's not about you or it's not all about you. I forget exactly what it is. And the whole idea is that this book is about taking your life seriously and really coming to terms with the fact that your life matters or it should matter or it could matter and for your life to matter you actually have to build a life for yourself you have to build a self one that you love a life that you love and that's really going to be the project of the book is how do you build a self in a life that you love and the quote that you read is really focusing on the fact that that whole project really gets off the ground from art or at least art plays a crucial role in giving us a vision of a whole life that's worth living and what philosophy is trying to tell you to do is be more reflective on what would be required to live a life like that if i want to be worthy of admiration if i want to feel that there's something high and important about my life art can give me kind of a broad vision of that but only philosophy can give me the principles and tools to bring that into reality and so the rest of the book is going to ref is going to flesh out those principles and those tools right and another theme of this chapter in terms of how you live this life is you talk about taking control of your life and at some point you use the term you are your own self programmer so in a world where we hear so much about determinism, about uh, I couldn't help it, as Ayn Rand puts it in her book, this is a motto of your heroes, you are actually saying, no, you are the author of your own life. Yeah, I mean, the key idea of the book, and this runs throughout every chapter, and indeed, I think you'll find it on almost every page, is that you are a being with free will, that, as Ayn Rand put it, you're a being of self-made soul. And the whole question of the book is given that you have a certain kind of fundamental control over your life, given that you have, as what we can talk about when we turn to the next lesson, you have control over your mind and therefore your thinking, your values, your character, then the question is how are you gonna use that control? Are you gonna take control and are you gonna build something and what should you build? But it, it all presupposes that you have this kind of control over your life and the if you don't have control, if you're determined by outside forces, if you're shaped by outside forces, then you don't need guidance on how to live. Indeed, you can't do anything with guidance on how to live. And we're so often taught to think about human beings as deterministic creatures. And often even the best intellectuals in the culture think that we're determined. I mean, if you think about somebody like Sam Harris, but I mean, he's far from the only one by and large most certainly most secular thinkers are determinists and if you hold that kind of view the project of self-creation never gets off the ground and that is a tragedy and the people who spread those ideas are really at war with the best in human beings and one thing that i have to say about this book is you don't shy away from 
naming names and uh, criticizing other people who have who are quite influential on the issue of making us understanding ourselves and the world around us and uh, it's it's one of the enjoyable parts of the book so let's go then to lesson number two you control your mind so the lesson is take charge and reading from the section you control your mind quote we face choices in life some are big life-changing decisions others are small even trivial but it's our choices that define who we are and how we live it's our choices that shape our soul and our life so the basic claim of this book is that your soul is self-made you create it and can recreate it through your choices end of quote so what you're telling us here is you are what you do you are what your choices and actually it reminded me this was not planned i just happened to have it by here on another of my favorite books which is called extreme ownership and this is a very liberating feeling right that you have the chance to direct yourself in terms of where you're gonna go in life and this is through a series of choices but why don't you tell us more about lesson number two take charge every ethics every view of how you should live your life is based on a view of what you are and so one way to think about this chapter is really this is my take and it's really my understanding of the objectivist take about human nature and that the most important thing you need to understand about human nature is the nature of the mind that 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 we gain knowledge and can form values by reason and that reason is volitional that you, it that it's under your direct control and the kind of basic guidance in the chapter is take control one of the the core of ayn rand's i uh, view of free will is that it's our ability to function or to regulate the functioning of our mind to take control over how our mind operates the level of awareness that we bring to our activities and that if you do take charge of your mind then you can gain knowledge and you can understand the world and you can navigate your way effectively through it and you can shape the course of your life in a positive direction towards happiness but if you don't if you're passive if you turn away from the facts then you are in one sense shaping who you are like you're 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 making the decision not to think not to take control of your life um, but in another sense, you're not in control of your life anymore. You're choosing to be shaped by environmental forces, by accident, by you know the the whim of the moment, and that whatever else you can say about that kind of course of action, it won't lead to happiness. And at some point, you mention, well, there is something to be said about the fact that from many Catholic families, you have the kids also being Catholic or the family is Muslim, the kid is also Muslim. But does this mean that the kids don't have free will? No, it means that people have free will, but quite often because they don't put like the machine, they don't turn it on and they stay out of focus, they don't decide to think for themselves. This is why you have the default, let's say, option, which is going with uh, the tradition or going with the group. So the fact that why is most people in a Muslim country Muslims it's because the default is that people don't actually pursue this independent thinking. It doesn't mean that you are a byproduct of your environment. But as you say, you will become a byproduct of your environment if you don't, if you don't take the responsibility to actually think. Any other comment yeah, on lesson two? Well, I mean, the I go really in depth into uh, free will in that chapter, including the arguments for and against it. So um, you, you mentioned, like, is this a philosophy book? Is this a self-development book? And the you could write a book probably that was in effect by an objectivist, but was pure self-development. Here's just guidance and tactics and tips on how to be more successful, how to be more efficient, how to set goals. And that could be a really cool book. I wouldn't be against it. Um, but I wanted to write a book for the person who's more intellectual and who wants to think that there's real reasons and arguments for the view. And so it's not just like claiming that we have free will, but it's giving the argument for it. And it's addressing I think what I think the best arguments are in the culture against it. And so you'll you'll find a lot um you know presentation of like why i think this is even true 
why um, how, hasn't Sam Harris proven that um, we don't have free will? What about free will and cause and effect? What about you know the claims that they've run scientific experiments that prove that we don't have free will? The Labette experiments. So um, it's the, the main thing I want to point out is just that in that chapter, but throughout the book, the it's there's real arguments here, not just assertions, but it's arguments built with practical advice. So it's I'm trying to like never lose sight of both, which is making the case for what's true philosophically, but then never losing the tie to what are you going to do about it tomorrow? Like, how are you going to implement this in your life? How are you going to put it to work? Because I resent both things. I resent advice without arguments and arguments without practical application. And so that's, the, I think, the key to understanding like the approach that the book takes. And I think you succeed in this. So I'm an avid consumer of self-development books. I really like that this book is relatively brief. It's 250 pages where the actual content is. And yet there is no point which is hanging in the air. As you, as you said, you're actually still manning the opposition and there's no experiment about free will that people might have heard the one where we press the button and we have the wire in our mind you mention all of these so you deal with all these objections so this book is also has gives quite a good experience to the reader that it has a good flow and again it starts without a long introduction and every chapter is one lesson speaking of lessons let's move to lesson number three pursue happiness. So during this lesson, Don, you describe happiness in different ways. You attack it from different, you approach it from different angles. So you say happiness is a verdict on how your life is going, but also happiness is love of being alive. Happiness is also a goal you have to embrace by choice. And happiness at the end of the day is a state of successful living. So Don, there's so much that's been written and told about the pursuit of happiness. What is your contribution to this topic? Well, I mean, that, it's funny that you kind of reflect on the different ways that I'm formulating what happiness is, because it, if you had asked me what would be one of the hardest things to write in the book, I wouldn't have guessed that, but it turned out to be true because um, the you're trying to describe something to people that they haven't experienced or they've only experienced partially. And if you think about Ayn Rand's novels, which are, I think, um, or even said, we'll come to Ayn Rand in a second, but I asked some of my friends while I was writing it, I was like, what are examples of characters who you think like in, in, in well-known fiction, aside from Ayn Rand's that you think like conveys what, what happiness is. And people came up short which is really interesting. Um, and, and so like trying to concretize that and make real, uh, you know, I was reaching for as many examples and aspects and kind of characterizations that I thought would bring to mind what I have in mind when I talk about happiness, because the one thing I wanted to push back against is the view that happiness is kind of like this, just, yeah, I'm feeling good. Like, I'm having fun. Things are awesome. Like, yeah, that's part of it. Like, it, it, you know, if you're a happy person, you're in a good mood, like that, that can be a fine characterization of a good mood. But I view happiness as something deep and profound. And one of the things I really wanted to get across in this book that I don't think often comes across when objectivists write about um, in nonfiction about an egoist ethics is the spirit spiritual depth and grandeur uh, that is involved in happiness. It comes through in Ayn Rand's novels. And not, nothing will ever come close. Well, I shouldn't say ever. Ever is a long time. Nothing has come close uh, to depicting it as Ayn Rand novels in fiction. But it's really hard to capture in nonfiction terms the kind of grandeur and depth of what happiness is, how profound it is, the way in which one regards their life as sacred and takes deep meaning and joy in the moments of their life. And so that like part of what I was just trying to get across in this chapter is the goal that I'm setting you on is way, way bigger and way more meaningful and fulfilling than what might come across by a more superficial understanding of happiness. 
And you also address this very difficult issue, which is how is it that whenever we have what we'd call a moment of happiness, let's say I got that my dream job, already the next moment we set for a, a, a bigger goal. Therefore, it would make sense to believe this idea that uh, you know the treadmill of happiness, you never reach it. But actually, you make the case that no, it makes sense that you always set higher and higher goals, but at the same time, it makes sense to say that you are happy. So these things, the, the, the stuff that you always want something more, doesn't mean that you never are going to be happy. So you break this dichotomy that we find in culture that, uh, oh, we never arrive, therefore we're never going to be happy. Yeah, it's a really plausible view, right? Because, I mean, I'll tell you, my life's goal um, until the age of, I think, 29, when I finally achieved it, was to have write a book and have it published. Like that, like I, I literally, when I was younger, used to go into, well, then there was Borders Books, but Barnes & Noble, and look on the bookshelf and be like, that's where my book's going to be. And like, that's what drove me. And then when I was 29, Yaron and I published Free Market Revolution and it happened and I got to go and see the book on the shelves. And it was it was an incredible experience, but it was not this sort of like, ah, now I've done it feeling. It was, all right, what's the next mountain to climb? And so it's really plausible that, oh, you think something will make you happy, but when you get it, no, it doesn't make you happy. Well, the right way to think about it is that what happiness is, is pursuing and achieving goals that propel you to further goals to further goals. It is growth and it wouldn't be satisfying without the achievements. That is if the, the idea that it's all about the process. No, the process has to include achievements. Um, Rourke has a line in the Fountainhead about, um, you, you know, is your life like a, a straight line or where there stops? And stops are points where you go, this was worth achieving. This was meaningful for its own sake. Okay, now back to the next climb. And he says, yeah, there were stops. And so that's the perspective to have in your life, that it, that it's achievement leading to achievement. And so um, is it true that you can't satisfy your desires? No, it's not true. But what you can't satisfy and what it, one should never want to satisfy is desire. Desire as such, constantly be, being in the premise of aspiring to something bigger and better and greater than what you've achieved before. One last thing on this section, on, on this lesson on happiness. The title of your book is Effective Egoism. So the obvious thought that people will have is, oh, wait, I thought I knew effective altruism. So why effective egoism? We're going to talk about effective egoism. Am I right that this is the section where you also talk about how altruism, the way it is understood, uh, which is do things for other people, that altruism properly understood is incompatible with happiness. Yeah. So if you think about the chapters, it's counseling you to pursue happiness. There's a real question. Well, okay, great. Why do we need this book? And there's really two reasons. It's because the culture has offered us on the one hand, um, happiness without morality. And that's the whole kind of self-help genre or the positive psychology movement. And again, it's not that these have nothing to offer, but they leave out what I think is the fundamental ingredient of happiness, which is a moral code that's going to give you the basic principles, the values and the virtues that are going to add up to a happy life. So that's happiness right. without morality. But then there's people say, well, look, you can't drop morality. Morality is really important. And what they offer instead is morality without happiness. And this is in one form or another, some variant of self-sacrifice, some variant of altruism, of, play, of saying that, no, what's good is placing something above the self, serving something other than your own personal goals, your own personal happiness. And part of what then um, you have to explain to people, because what they're, what they're often taught explicitly and what they'll often say, if you say, well, altruism is against your happiness, it's like, no, it just means being kind to people, being nice to people. And if that's all it meant, then we'd have no disagreement because an effective egoist, the only your many of your most crucial values will be other human beings and other people, 
whether it's your friends, your children, your lover, like even the people in your neighborhood and a stranger that you have a kind of good conversation with or buy, you know, a product from and chat with for two seconds. Like these are important values in life. Um, but that can't be what altruism self-sacrifice means. And it's not in practice how it's used. And just to give one illustration, there's a lot, I give a number of examples and, and arguments for this, but just to take the most common one, who do you think would get the most moral credit in, 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 by most people in the culture? A billionaire who gives away $100 million to charity or a guy who gives away his $10,000 life savings to charity? Well, it's the clearly billionaire who's the doing by guy. far. Yeah, it's clearly the second guy. But the billionaire is doing way more good. But he's not sacrificing as much, right? He probably won't even notice a $100 million that's gone missing, whereas the you know other person has taken away everything that he has in life. And so it should at least give, give you reason to pause and think, yeah, maybe our moral code really is measuring how much we lose and not about just like, being sweet to other people or something definitely so this reminds me another good thing with the book you might be reading something which is let's say this combination of philosophy and self-development and suddenly there's a good insight on politics or for example on uh, why capitalism is a, is a is a is a good system so it has it has a lot of stuff and these things jump out from pages when you don't expect them Anyway, I'm next just lesson. as an aside, I'm glad I'm glad you you think so. Like that was I uh, most of my favorite books, the way that I experiencing them is almost a sense of like frustration, which is, man, this is so dense. I could just like sit with this one paragraph all day and kind of pull insights out of it. And so I I tried to write something with that, but that doesn't read as dense. That reads like easily like you can kind of breeze through it, but you have the sense of like, man, there's just a lot of stuff packed here. You know, it it would be a great tragedy if people thought my books were easily skimmable. Absolutely not. I'm just from the top of my head. I remember at some point you say something like, by the way, you remember how everyone says capitalism is about the survival of the fittest. It's the exact opposite. It's the first time in history where the quote people who are less fit can actually have a good life because what they are after is not going to be taken from anyone else. We don't fight over scraps. We have abundance and this means that also the less fortunate can have a good life so you are uh, you are putting aside this, uh, myths and uh, and stuff in 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 various parts of the book next lesson follow reason here's a quote quote just as we are born not knowing how to walk we are born not knowing how to think the difference is that everyone eventually learns how to walk. You don't find freshmen rolling down the halls of their high school. You do, however, find plenty of grown men and women uninterested in what's true or unable to see through lousy arguments and bullshit claims. So this chapter is actually telling us, Don, that thinking is a survival tool. And maybe we don't understand it, but this is something that needs to be cultivated. Think how much time we spend training our muscles and yet we don't train the most important thing, which is our mind. Yeah. I mean, there's a, a, a kind of view in the history of philosophy that's really famous that like reason doesn't deal with ends. It just deals with means, right? It can't tell you what you should go after. It can only tell you, um, like if you want to go after something, this is an effective way to do it or an ineffective way to do it. And that is so wrong and so far from Ayn Rand's view, the, the way Harry Binswanger, um, who, who has appeared on this show, I believe, um, but was a friend of Ayn Rand's and teaches at Ayn Rand University, the way he put it, which I, I think I even quote in the book, is reason's a vital organ. Like it's, it's, a, it's a survival action guiding faculty and so the idea that it that you couldn't use reason to assess your ends that it was just there to say hey your ends deuce is wild go after whatever you want just go after it in this effective logical way like that is so wrong and so disastrous um and so the the, 
the kind of view of reason is, all right, you have this tool, like this is your master tool that's vital for your ends, your means, for everything that you could possibly want from life. Well, you better use it well and cultivate it. And the and Ayn Rand, so Ayn Rand has this view that um, our three fundamental values, the three values that are that are core to happiness, our reason, purpose, and self-esteem. And part of what it means to hold reason as a value is that I'm gonna really take care and cultivate my means of survival. I'm gonna make it as powerful as possible and treat it with a sacred respect because it, it, it unlocks everything I could possibly want and that would be possibly worth wanting. And without it, I'm doomed. And so that, if, if you're pursuing happiness, the fundamental guidance has to be to think and to learn how to think, because without that, you can't get anywhere else. And this is also a chapter which made me extremely self-conscious in terms of how many times we might use our minds in a way which doesn't lead us to truth, but it leads us to the things that we want to discover. It's what we would call rationalizations. And at some point, you you say that we should follow the evidence and not stack the deck in favor of what we want to believe. So, for example, if I want to believe that uh, the pandemic uh, never happened and I Google it, I will find many, many examples. And then I can tell myself, hey, look, I looked for the evidence. I found the evidence. That's it. But what you're actually saying is, no, be very careful. You need to put a lot of work and you need to always, your antenna needs to be towards truth, not towards what you are trying to find. And we've discussed it in the past, uh, Don, and actually you taught this also in the communication class in the Iron University, that it's not good research to say, for example, well, there is no, uh, you know, there is no climate change because I read these five climate skeptics and now I can tell you, look, I have the evidence, there is no... Uh, there is no climate change. So using your mind and finding evidence is something which is difficult, even when you tell yourself, oh, that's what I'm doing, but actually you just try to evade the truth rather than to discover it. Yeah, and it's not even necessarily evasion, right? Like if you ask most people, like, are you rational? They'd say yes. And the, the, the um, and part of the reason why they say yes is because like it feels, there's a lot of things that feel like thinking. It seems like I'm thinking like, yeah, I didn't just decide that because um, some, you know, my, my favorite Republicans criticize climate change, I'm against it. No, I read a book. I read two books on it. But what you didn't, what, what you did was you read books that supported a view you were already inclined to agree with. And so part of what I, I'm arguing there is that to really cultivate your mind, you have to build a habit of recognizing that well, I could be really susceptible to trying to confirm my beliefs and I should. And so to be able to be confident that, yeah, I'm really thinking about this, I should be actively challenging myself and pushing back on it. Um, I think the, the this is, it, it's something that like even objectivists will often make this mistake is um, I, I, and I'll, I've made this mistake. I remember when I was a teenager, I was so um, careful about what books did I read because I didn't want to get polluted with the wrong information. So like, is this a reliable book on capitalism? And if it wasn't a reliable book, well, maybe I shouldn't even bother reading it. And, you know, th thankfully, I didn't, I didn't stay with that kind of mindset for too long. But actively seeking to push against your own beliefs, I think is really crucial to being confident that your own beliefs are true. And that should be what you're interested in. What you should be interested in is not like, how do I prove that I'm right? But how do I get to what's really true? Because again, if we think about what the mind is, it's, you know, you're navigating your way through a dark room, right? And what is the number one thing you want if you want to navigate successfully through a dark room? Is you want a damn light. And it's by using your mind to your fullest capacity that you turn on light and and turning on the light is it starts with activating your mind which is an issue of free will but then it starts with learning how to use your mind more and more effectively and that's what valuing reason consists of right and when it comes to things that i took away from the book i have a whole list with 
sources that you give in the book if we want to dive deeper in the topics. So there are many good books that you are citing. And on this issue of uh, how do you know when you really know something, you mentioned a series of lectures by our common friend Greg Salmieri, which I found very, very useful. So quite often I was reading the book, then I was pausing, going to Amazon, checking a source, or going to YouTube and watching a whole lecture. So this, the, this book gives a lot of food for thought. Okay, going to my favorite lesson now. Lesson number five, create values. So my reaction when I finished reading this section, this lesson, I sent a message to Don saying, this should be a whole book by itself. So for me, it's the best chapter I've read in a self-development book. And this is why I actually haven't chosen a quote because the whole chapter is a quote. So lesson number five, Don, create values. So where do we start here? You give very interesting personal stories from your years, your first, uh, your first years in ARI, your friendship with Alex Epstein and how it has influenced you. But then you give us all these tools. Where do we start with this, uh, with this lesson? Well, I mean, we can start just at, at a more philosophic level about the fact that um, if you read most moral guidance, one thing is conspicuous conspicuously either absent or like relegated to a footnote and that is the role of work in life and yet if you think about just at, at the level of how much time you spend on something most of us spend most of our time working and part of what i argue in the book is if you want to understand happiness uh, the role of work in life is so central to happiness that if you're giving advice on happiness that is not deeply, deeply focused on your relationship to productive work, you're not even playing the right game. You're not even in the ballpark of what happiness consists of. And so the, the core of a happy life is a life organized around productive work. It doesn't necessarily mean that work is the most important thing to you. I think for many people, it will be. For some people, not necessarily. Like, um, But it will be the centerpiece of your life that everything else is organized and built around. And it will be a deep component of your happiness. And I have never met a happy person who did not really enjoy their work. They might not have loved it in the way that like Ayn Rand's characters did, but they really enjoyed it. They got a lot of satisfaction out of it. And so the goal in the chapter is to um, really investigate, okay, given work's unique place in life and in happiness and in morality, how do we go about figuring out what we want to do and achieving what we want to do? And, the, and so the bulk of the chapter is answering that question because it's something that I struggled with. Um, but it's something I learned a lot about over time. And I wrote, I started writing this book while I was working as a freelancer and part of my freelancing was writing, but a lot of it was coaching people. And usually it started out, I thought I was going to be coaching them on communications projects, right? Like helping them write a book, helping them uh, give a presentation. And that, that I, I did some of that, but what I found again and again is what most people wanted help with was just how do I figure out what I want to do and how do I get there? And, and so I was able to, um, help a lot of people make progress in that area. And so this is kind of distilling the best of the knowledge that worked for me and that I found worked for others when they put it into practice. And what you've just mentioned is just the very, very, very beginning of the chapter, which is how to find a fulfilling career. But then you give us very useful tools on how to become good in this path that we have chosen. And for me, a key takeaway is how important it is that you need to be good in what you're doing. Otherwise, you'll be like the many who fail. But this has also the opposite reading. You might be discouraged when you hear so many new businesses fail. But then what you say in the book is, yeah, but do these businesses really take it very seriously? Are they passionate about the industry, the field, reading, uh, figuring things out? So at some point, let me give you a very simple example. You say people who don't take it work very seriously. Quote, they want a successful blog, but don't think about how to give readers valuable content they can't find anywhere else. End of quote. Now, just think about this thing, people, right? Do you actually give readers valuable content 
that you don't find anywhere else. Now, when I think about my work in these terms, valuable stuff that people can't find anywhere else, now suddenly I'm going to hopefully become better because now the bar is higher, right? It's not just, eh, I'll go through the motions. No, you have to be very, very good. You have to build the skills. You call it career capital, rare skills that your employer can't find anywhere else. And then am I good at that uh, at that level? And of course, this comes from Don, who he gave us the wake up call last year in his Ocon talk that says, remember every time you create content that people, it's it's your content versus everything else they could be doing in the world, including having sex. So every time they read your content, it's like on the margins, this is even better than sex. So this this is, again, it sounds like simple, but at the same time, I find it profound. Like, hey, that's where your body is in terms of creating and producing good work. Yeah, I mean, the you can do anything you want in life if you're good enough at it, right? Like, that's the simple fact is like, if I'm, you know, if imagine that I'm the best lawyer that's out there lawyering, right? I can have whatever kind of career I want within law if I'm good enough. And so a lot of what I'm focused on is like, how do you get so good that you can do what you want? And even I think I use um, my favorite. So uh, one of my favorite, I'm a big com- uh, comedian fan or fan of comedians. And one of my favorites is Steve Martin. And he has uh, a, a, a line that um, he so good they can't ignore you. Like that was his answer to like, how do you get successful in life, right? Everybody has these tricks and tips and hacks. And his view is, no, you just get really, really good. And part of, and so there, part of what I talk about is the fact that though there's a lot of specific knowledge that goes into getting really good in in any particular field, there is an overall kind of trajectory that people follow from beginning to what we can call it mastery. And so talking about how to navigate those steps and some of the challenges navigating those steps. You know, you mentioned this this chapter could be turned into a whole book. And when you said it, I said, oh, shoot, I'm probably going to have to write that. I, I've, I've told our CEO, Tal Safani, I might uh, rope him into co-writing it with me. Um, but a lot of the challenges are often psychological. That is, you're doing something really hard. Most of the time you're failing and you have no, you don't know going in that you really will be able to be good enough, right? Like that you will be able to make it work. And I talk a lot about my struggles as somebody who wanted to be an objectivist, intellectual, professional writer. And there was years, I mean years, where my stuff was barely publishable, only with the help and rewriting of editors all the time, where each day wasn't the fulfillment of, aha, I wrote some really great, exciting, clarifying thing, but instead getting told, this is not good. Like you're making all kinds of mistakes and really wrestling with, can I do this? And so I think part of part of what um, people need to understand is that that is normal, that those kind of setbacks and frustrations and doubts are normal. But then if you follow the if you follow certain principles of gaining mastery that um, I think most people with the right amount of effort can overcome them and can build, it might not look, the career might not end up looking like you thought it was. I remember when I started out in objectivism, I wanted, I'm going to be the next Leonard Peikoff and discover the, you know, ground earth shaking fundamental truths of philosophy. And part of what happened as I, you know, pursued that kind of trajectory was realizing that, yeah, that's not exactly where my strengths lie. Um, and, and it's not what gives me the most satisfaction. And so part of the process of pursuing mastery is you figure out exactly what form of mastery you can and want to achieve. And so just, I think, giving people a clear sense of what the path will look like and some tips for achieving it, um, it is really helpful. And it can be really liberating just to know that No, like it's not like the people I admire just woke up one day and were really, really good at what they're doing. Like, you know, they were just like me in a fundamental sense. And that means that I can become just like them. And I didn't use this quote in the book, but I was just rewatching 
with my girlfriend a few weeks ago, one of my favorite movies, it's called The Edge. And uh, Anthony Hopkins and Alec Baldwin get stranded in the woods and um, they're being attacked by this really dangerous grizzly bear. And they decide like, we gotta, we gotta fight back. And Anthony Hopkins is trying to get Alec Baldwin motivated. And he starts to say, all right, say it with me. What one man can do, another can do. And, and that is a helpful perspective on things sometimes. Like other, the people I admire are just like me. They've just gone through a process that I'm only at the beginning of. And there are many books that talk about this, uh, the road to mastery. But I find the difference in this book is that you are actually giving us a roadmap. So you're giving us some very specific tools. One, for example, is the tool of deliberate practice. Now, you describe it as something a bit like stretching. Like when you stretch, every time it's difficult, you reach a bit further, but this is actually how you improve. So it's deliberate practice, but at the same time is putting in the hours. So you mentioned Darwin, for example, how, how many hours and hours and hours he spends doing like unsexy things. And it's not that uh, at some point he had this uh, strike of genius. This strike of genius comes through deliberate practice, but also through putting in the hours. So this is a, an interesting dichotomy, right? It comes through repetition, but this repetition has to be very, very, very thoughtful. It's not just that you're drifting, you do what you've done uh, every, every time. And actually, I was reading the biography of Pep Guardiola, who is the best uh, soccer, as you'd call it, coach ever. And at some point, he made a decision that changed football forever. He decided that Messi would play as a striker. And I always thought that this was like a moment of genius. And he says, I was watching our opponents on video for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And at some point, I said, hey, they have a gap there. Well, obviously, that's where Messi should play. So these moments of genius don't come in terms of, uh, you know, it's out of nowhere. It's the result of very systematic, very consistent, but also very targeted work that uh, that you should be doing. So that part there in the book where you talk about uh, targeted, uh, about uh, uh, the, the roadmap on having the creativity of a Steve Jobs or a Howard Rock and reverse engineering what they're doing, I think this is something which is very unique in the book, or at least it stuck in my mind in a unique way. You made it land you made it easily graspable in specific uh, in specific steps. Yeah, and it, it can, it, when you see the end result, it looks like magic. Leonard Peikoff used to talk about how Ayn Rand, he would marvel at the fact that she could see by like a formulation that you used on page one, what conclusions you'd reach on page 20, far removed from this little, uh, this little phrase. And yet, if you've ever um, had the the good fortune to get personal feedback from Leonard on your work, he is able to do that. And it's precisely because by constantly thinking about things and doing philosophy, he developed what Ayn Rand had, which is this incredible pow um, pattern recognition where you could see instantly the implications of something, but it came from years and years and years of pushing himself to see the logic of how philosophic ideas play out. And it's the same reason why, you know, I, I can't do that exactly. Um, but in writing, you know, I can read an op-ed that somebody's struggling with and say, like, you're going off the rails for these reasons, but it's because like I, you know, for 15 years have constantly like done the same thing over and over again. And so you, you can, um, the, the, those skills are achievable. And part of then what I'm trying to give you the guidance is what are you doing during those years so that you go from a beginner to somebody who can do that kind of magic? So chapter five, lesson number five is the best uh, roadmap to mastery. Now we have to go to lesson number seven, which is your favorite. Very quick stop from lesson number six, which is honor the self. And the reason I want to stop here done is because this is the lesson, this is the section where finally we get to the idea of effective egoism, which is also the title of your book. So tell us something about effective egoism and how it relates to honoring the self, and then we will go to your favorite lesson. Well, I'll say this much about it, which is um, that uh, it should be interesting that a book on effective egoism 
doesn't get to egoism explicitly and directly until lesson six. And there's a re there's an important reason for that. And it's a reason Ayn Rand always stressed, which is that the beneficiary of, uh, of morality, like who should benefit from moral action, that that is really a, it's an important issue, but it's not the primary issue that in order to answer that, you have to know like, what is the good? How do you achieve it? And then it becomes clear, well, who should benefit from all of this work? And, and so in order to really get why it's right to be self-interested and pursue your self-interest, you have to have a richer conception of what are your interests. And so the, the early part of the book is giving us a real vision of what your interests are. And then it's, it's really almost a, um, it, it doesn't take a lot to see that, yeah, I should pursue my interests and I shouldn't sacrifice them. But that, the, so um, it, I, in many ways, I'd say that's the least original lesson, but there is something really valuable about it, um, even for people who've studied Ayn Rand for a, a long time. And, and this is true of the book at large, but particularly this chapter, which is um, like, I've been studying these ideas now for a quarter century, roughly. And it, is really hard to learn in certain respects. Like there's a there's a lot that goes into understanding objectivism and a lot that goes into arguing for it and being able to defend it effectively. And so these are my attempts to go to um, core issues in objectivism, but in a way that reflects what I think are the, should make it a lot easier for you to understand some often challenging ideas and to be able to defend them um, if you agree with them, but that, you know, it's designed to give kind of the best formulations I found for explaining these ideas. And here's a very good formulation you make in this chapter. You, an interesting thought experiment, you call it something like playing the full movie before making a choice thought experiment. So for example, let's say someone is uh, married or in a relationship and he has a chance for an affair. What you should do is you shouldn't just take out of context, oh, this is going to be a fun night. You should play. You should think how it should play out within the whole context in the future. And then you made a very interesting point that the only crystal ball that we have for the future, or actually the most efficient crystal ball, is principles. Principles that guide us is the best, are the best predictors that can tell us, is this going to be a good thing? Or a bad thing like uh, i have a line of cocaine in front of me shall i snore it or not like how is it going to play out in the future and how what are the principles that will guide whether this is good or whether this is something bad so for me this was a very practical takeaway from this chapter that yes you can actually project and in some ways see the future the future is way more in your control than you would otherwise think yeah, I think that's a, it's an important part. Like we can't literally predict all of the details of how, how something impacts us across our life, both in terms of time and but also different aspects of our life. How is this going to affect my character, my psychology, my emotional state, my financial health? But principles are precisely what solve that problem. That they're able to allow us to to predict full context and long range. Um, what a course of action is going to do. Is it going to be pro-life or anti-life, pro-happiness or anti-happiness? And therefore, if you're dedicated to your happiness, you have to be dedicated to principles. And anybody says, oh, why shouldn't you throw your principles out the door when it's going to benefit your life? It's like, that's just, it. you're speaking gibberish at that point because the very thing that you need in order to benefit your life is principles. And so that's, you're throwing out the very thing that allows you to achieve what's best for your life. Right. And now let's move to the final lesson, lesson number seven, seek pleasure. And I know there are many people who they found this to be the most uh, captivating lesson. Quick quote that will get us going for this chapter. Quote, the world is filled with potential values. Your job, your only job in this world is to find them and enjoy them. Happiness often remains in the background. To truly enjoy your life, you need to regularly bring it to the foreground. So, seeking pleasures, how could it, how could it have anything to do with morality? 
Well, I mean, we were talking a little while ago about the way in which, um, you know, happiness has this quality of like, oh, I achieve things, but it's bringing me to future achievements. We're so often properly acting long range. We're doing something now in order to achieve something later, right? Like, okay, uh, I'm taking a shower. Why? So I can go to the store. Why? So I can buy some groceries. Why? So I can cook a nice dinner tonight. Well, the only reason to engage in all that effortful future directed action is for things that are worth living through for their own sake, things that are worth experiencing as ends in themselves. And that's what pleasure is. Now, not every pleasure um, is, is positive, is healthy, advancing your life. So you can't pursue your happiness by pursuing whatever's pleasurable. But if you're on a pro-life trajectory, if you're pursuing happiness in a principled way, then the only way to actually enjoy your life, experiencing your life as something worth living through for its own sake is through pleasure. And so part of the counsel of the book is eke as much pleasure out of a rational pro-life course of living that you can, but then it's an investigation of the most important profound pleasures that life has to offer. Now we talked about one of them, which is productive work, but then the book goes into um, a, a few others and above all uh, goes into the, um, the pleasure that art has to offer and the pleasure of relationships, love and sex. Right. So this is one, again, one of the very few books where you see a very positive portrayal of, of sex, which again, reaches the balance between the idea that, oh, sex is, uh, it's bad and you should only do it to reproduce versus, oh, I'm a pickup artist. So I just need to have a lot of coins. So you, you're basically saying sex is too serious and has too much gravitas for either of these, uh, uh wrong, uh, interpret uh, approaches to, to sex. But also on the part of romantic or on the part of art. So you describe your experience in a museum. And then, of course, I went straight to see what is this uh, painting that you're talking about. And I can tell you that I had for some moments this, it felt as if I was in that museum with you. So these are very personal in, reflections that you have about these topics, but they are based on how one should experience them that will be related or relatable also to your uh, to your audience and one more thing here on the on the issue of uh, actionable advice you mentioned at some point make yourself worthy of love and again i found this very extreme ownership kind of stuff right right yeah, they say love is like you look uh, for a needle in a stack, how it's called, the saying. But what you're actually saying is, hey, how about you are the magnet? So now you like the needle comes to you rather than you looking for the needle. So we come back to this theme, which is prevalent throughout the book, that there are things that it's not your, it's that you are not to blame for these things, but you have the responsibility to fix these things. So you might be alone, let's say, because you grew up, you didn't have masculine role models, whatever. But now you have the free will to understand this. And now it's your job to fix it. So something can not be your fault, but still it's your responsibility to fix it. Again, let's say you, was, you were born in a poor neighborhood, N not your fault, but now it's your responsibility. What am I going to do to fix this and to have a better life. So this balance between fault, not my fault, but my responsibility was something I found very, very insightful. And it was like the last taste that uh, the book uh, left in me. Well, it's, um, I mean, if you think about what a romantic relationship is, it's you're inviting somebody into your world. Like that is that, like, that's the deal, right? Like, welcome to my world. And what kind of world are you welcoming them into and who on the world would want to enter it right like and so the starting point and look there's lots of great tips for how do i meet people and i know it can be hard i i've certainly struggled with it at various points in my life but the fundamental has to be is this a world worth entering uh, although i do want to say you said the book ends with this no it ends with sex and that's very deliberate because i want it like what is the what is the most unchristian anti-christian way that i can end a book about morality 
by upholding the thing that they regard as the biggest threat to morality, which I regard as one of the biggest rewards of living a moral life, which is a, a great sex life. So just had to correct you on that detail. But yeah, that's the that, that's a core idea um, that I'm trying to get across in that section. Well, we already told people this is a very uncommon book. And again, this uncommon book is Effective Egoism and Individualist Guide to Pride, Purpose and the Pursuit of Happiness. Let me say a big thank you to our super chat. Many thanks to Ryan. Someone asks, how can we promote uh, the book? So Don will tell us, but the obvious thing, leave a, first of all, buy the book. Again, I'm not giving you the good example. I have the the uncorrected proof that's because i live in a developing country we don't have amazon here so i the, the actual book hasn't arrived yet so get the book write an amazon review but also something i found useful when you take something when the book you find something useful just go in social media and explain how this book particularly help you to understand something so this this book will give you tools so don't just spread the wall, oh, it's a good book. It's a good book because it gave me this and this and this tool, and this tool can be put into practice and make your life uh, better. So Don, how can people, what are other ways that people can spread the word? Well, I mean, I think you named the most important one. You've probably sold more books than I have so far uh, just off your tweet. And what you said <laughs> was really important that the more specific you are, like that's what's gonna sell, like this idea, help me in this way like that i think that's what really captures people people's attention um but the uh, the other thing i'll add is look i'm not trying to my goal here is not like making the new york times bestseller list or so on it's to help people live better lives and so the most important thing is if you read it and you think yeah this book really resonates put it in the hands of somebody that you think it could really help and that it could really um, improve their lives. The, the one, one thing I'll say is I wrote this book deliberately for non-objectivists, people who might not have ever heard of Ayn Rand, who, who might not be interested in Ayn Rand. Um, it's, it doesn't presuppose that you've read Atlas. It's not trying to sell you on a whole philosophy. It's trying to sell you on a moral framework to live your life. And a number of people have told me that they've given the book to people in their lives who have never heard, never read of Ayn Rand, and that they really loved it and found it valuable. And to me, that like that is that that was the challenge. Can I write a book that makes egoism appealing to somebody who's not been sold by Ayn Rand's novels? And so that that's the way I'd think about it. You know, to make the book successful, all I care about is that it's helping people live more successful lives. And so if you can get it into the hands of somebody who could really take it and run with it, that to me is what really matters. So just buy a copy and put it into their hands and you've done your job. And again, and use it selfishly because there's so many good, uh, so many good uh, tools here. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Don. Many thanks to our viewers. You know the drill. If you like what we're doing, if you appreciate that we put effort and thank you very much for uh, we have uh, higher views lately. Subscribe, share the world. Before you send the book, maybe you send someone this episode so that we whet their appetite to check out the book. If you have questions regarding philosophy or if you want us to cover topics in the future, you can also drop us an email at newideal at einrand.org. But if you have a question which is specifically for one of the Q&A episodes we do on philosophy, you can send the question at experts at einrand.org. So many thanks to our viewers. Many thanks to Don. Uh, I know that this book is going to make me better in many things, including hopefully in, in creating content for New Idea Live. Many thanks for watching. Many thanks for your time, everyone. Bye-bye.